I should like to draw your attention today to the Gospel of John, chapter 16 and verse 33. The Gospel of John, chapter 16 and verse 33. John 16, 33. These things I have said to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. For I have overcome the world. In this world, we will have tribulation. Some of your translations might say troubles. Our experience bear out our Savior's testimony here. Indeed, in this world, we have troubles and tribulations of many sundry kinds have so much of them that we might despair of life itself that troubles heap upon us so heavily. We are not alone in this. The Apostle Paul knew it, the psalmist knew it, and the man of all sorrows, the suffering servant, he knew of the troubles of which he spoke, and his disciples would come to know as well as they followed in his step. We know the sufferings of sickness, the troubles of bodies that break down and decay, of minds that are prone to error, to mistakes, and to diseases even. We know of loss of all kinds. We know of offenses and injustices, of unfairness, We know of the repercussions of our own sins and the sins of others. We know of famines. We know of droughts. We know of the ravages of nature, of storms, of plagues. We know all kinds of trouble. And we have spent much time, this human race, trying to find some way of getting out of trouble, finding some way to escape them entirely, to end them, move beyond it. And all of that, we haven't found it. All the advances we make in technology, we have not eliminated the fundamental problems the day-to-day troubles of our lives. We have perhaps altered some of them. They are still with us. For all of our philosophies and ideologies and worldviews, we have not yet found one that completely eliminates the troubles of our lives. Jesus here does not offer us a way out. He does not say, you may have troubles in this world, or you will end less. He says that you will most certainly have trouble. It's going to happen. It's even going to happen in this context if you are following his directions precisely. Indeed, in the context of these verses, he's talking about that tribulation that will come as a direct result of following him. If you follow Christ, the world around you, your non-believing neighbors will hate you in the way that the world hated Christ himself. There will be trouble, no matter what you do. You cannot control the circumstances. So what are we to do? Evidently, there is something to be done for Jesus wishes us to have peace. And we hear that and we say, oh, we could have peace. We wish that we would have peace. But we simply need this to align. We just need this one circumstance to alter and then we could have peace. We just need this to stop or to get better. And Jesus' solution does not lie in altering the circumstances 
of gaining some kind of mastery over them and then molding them to meet our needs and desires and wants. No, his solution involves a change, not of circumstances, but of perspectives. He does not offer us a way to get rid of the troubles, but a way to get through them, to overcome them, to grow by them rather than to be diminished by them. He offers us a way to suffer well. The way, the true way. All of us have been acquainted with suffering. All of us have found some means of dealing with it. Perhaps we have found greater success here or there and less success in other places. But I posit to you at the beginning of this series is that you will find no better way than the way which Christ commends. And throughout this series, I'd like to teach you the way, and as much as I have been taught the way, to point the way as much as I have been directed. My prayer is that here in the exposition of God's Word, your perspective would begin to change. Your understanding of the troubles and tribulations of life would begin to alter. And you would find that the things that hurt don't hurt so much as they used to. As the things that were painful are no longer so painful. And that your progress has become a bit easier, a bit less stifled. Let me pray. Father, there are so many troubles in life and they all seem so overwhelming. They have a way of blinding us, of making our vision narrow and short, of consuming us. Lord, we need your help to overcome the sensation, to see past the moment to something greater. We need your strength. Help us contend against our false perceptions, feelings. Lord, I need your help to teach these things that I still grapple with myself. I pray that you would give me the right voice, the right words to speak to the hurting souls who need to hear these words. I pray that your wisdom would come through with power and penetrate to the heart where the medicine is needed. Lord, I cannot do it you can do all things. I'm only a branch, you are the vine. Abide with me as I abide in you. Much fruit should be born for your glory in this humble work. Have your way in it, in Jesus' name, amen. In this world, we will have troubles. And we have to deal with them somehow. So left to our own devices, we come up with ways. Ways that are based on our perception. Our perceptions are very often that the troubles, the tribulation of the world, whatever they be, they're too great for us. We see the mobs coming after us to lay hands on us and drag us away to prison and we think there is no escape. We feel the doors being shut fast. We hear the clang of metal on hard walls. And we think there is nothing that could set us free. We hear their words, their testimony against us and think that we are undone. We hear the roaring of the beast, the crackle of the flame. And we are sure that all is lost. These threats, they seem much more than we can handle. And this is where we begin to really suffer with our troubles. 
When we feel the threat is too great to be met, that our doom is certain, that our fears are bound to come true, that there is no hope. And Jesus is speaking to a group of people here that have before them the most profoundly hopeless circumstance that ever has been. If there were ever men that could have been justified in falling to the temptation that all was truly lost, that the threat against them had surely prevailed, thoroughly prevailed, and that their lives were doomed. It was this handful who heard these words for the first time. For that very night, the one who spoke was betrayed a man that they had known well, one of their own number. And he was taken into custody and subjected to the authority of the chief priest and of the Roman governor. He was stripped of his dignity. He was beaten and spit upon and mocked and scorned. His friends abandoned him and denounced him. And then he was scourged. He was forced to carry his own cross out of the city to a dishonorable place where he was nailed to the tree and his side pierced and he died a slow, agonizing death. And he who knew no sin took on all the penalty of our sin and bore the fullness of the triune wrath of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as the work was finished, he expired there and was laid in a tomb. And there his body rested. And when next we see these men, they are hiding behind locked doors, overcome with despair and dismay. And Jesus says to them, ahead of all this, and ahead of all the things that are to come upon them as they are driven out of Jerusalem later on, away from their home, as many of them will meet with death nearly as horrific as that of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He tells them to take heart. He doesn't tell them, I will return, although he has said that many times before. He doesn't say, I will be there in your darkest moment and I will fetch you out. He says, take heart. In the midst of these circumstances that are what they are, take hold of your heart. That's what it means to take heart. It literally means to latch onto it, to grab hold of it, and to hold on to it so that it cannot wander astray that it cannot fall to the temptation to abandon hope. Take hold of it, and what are you holding on to? I have overcome the world. When it seems that the world has prevailed against you, take hold of your heart and force it to face the truth that I have overcome the world. This is a theme will recur throughout all of our sessions in this series on suffering well, taking hold of our heart and forcing it beyond what we perceive and what we sense to what we know is true, because God has said it, and his word is forever settled in the heavens. The transcendent creator and ruler of all things speaks, and our hearts must recognize his authority. We must make them to recognize his authority 
That is what Jesus is calling us to hear. And he is calling us to it so that we can have peace. It's in our best interest to do this because the end result is that no matter what is going on, we can remain at peace. And wouldn't that be wonderful if all the world could come against us and strip us of all things and put us to death and all the while we had peace. Wouldn't it be wonderful if sickness could come, if a thief could come and rob us blind, if the mockers and scorners of our world could defame us and we had peace. It's possible. It is possible because Jesus really has overcome. Yes, he was beaten, mocked, and scorned. Yes, he hung upon a tree. Yes, he was died and he buried. But he rose again from the grave on the third day. He rose and he appeared to these men again in the flesh. They felt his wounds. They knew it to be the man that had been with them before. Not only to these, but to hundreds of others. And we have their testimony, even to this day. He has overcome. And so we see those who saw him in his resurrected form, who was there for his ascension, go out and overcome all opposition to spread the glorious gospel of his completed work to tell men that now by grace through faith in Christ Jesus alone, sin is forgiven. And life eternal is given. No matter how the Jews tried to snuff them out in the beginning, or later on the Roman Empire with all of its resources and might, no matter how the governments of our own era have tried in various places of the world to snuff out the light of Christianity, none of them have prevailed. The gospel is still going forth. People are still giving their lives to Christ. And people are still living a life of peace and joy and hope in the very worst tribulation and the very worst troubles that the world has to offer them. You can read of it in Acts and in the Book of Martyrs, Fox's Book of Martyrs. You can read of it in the publications of VOM that come out every month. You can hear of it and so many biographies of the saints, and so many testimonies that are given week after week in our fellowships, you can see that it is true. Jesus has overcome. When we recognize that, it changes our perspective of the threat. So the world is coming against us. They have come to say all sorts of false things about us, under false pretense to throw us into prison as they did our Lord, to subject us to torture as they did him, perhaps even to put us to death for his name's sake. Well, apart from the overcoming Christ, we think that we have been overcome. This threat is sure to prevail against us because we cannot fight the whole mob. We cannot prevail against them. But if Christ has overcome and he has ascended and been placed over all things, it is not just that now we have somebody that can meet the threat that is on our side. Indeed, he has said in the previous chapter that he is abiding with us as the life of a tree abides in its branches. Actually, that's why they hate us in the first place. He is with us. And so, 
in him, there is enough there to meet the threat. It's not only that, it's that there's really no threat at all because he is sovereign over all things. He is the ruler of the universe. He has ascended to the throne and sits the right hand of the Father, interceding for us and working all things to our good, as it says in Romans 8.28. Because he has overcome and ascended, he has that authority. And so the threat of the situation is really no threat at all, is it? Because he is sovereign over it. And he has promised us not to allow anything that does not work out to our ultimate good. I'm convinced that this is a large part of that secret that Paul knew in Philippians 4 that enabled him to be content in any circumstance because he saw who was behind, ultimately, that circumstance. You say, well, God cannot be responsible for evil. No. But what others intend for evil he can use for good. Just ask Joseph. The threat is not there. In light of the position of our conquering Lord. And what would they threaten us with anyway? Are they going to kill us? Well, to die is gain. If they kill us, they have just stamped our ticket to glory. We are going to a place where we will no longer suffer any physical illness, any physical disability, any sort of mental disability or disease. We will know no more hunger, no more thirst, no more sorrow. Our tears will be wiped away. Our pain will be soothed. All of our injuries incurred throughout life, whether they be physical or mental or spiritual, they will be healed forever. We will have no longer the effects of sin. We will be able to commune perfectly with our triune God and with our fellow saints forever. No more opposition, no more of any of that. So death is no threat. They threaten us with death. It is like offering a man that which he should most desire. Well then, let's just leave the man alive, they will say, to live as Christ. As long as we are drawing breath, he has some purpose for us. And in that there is a joy that we have something yet to do for the honor of him who bought us at such a price. And we know that glory awaits us at the proper time. As there will be an end to whatever suffering he asked us to endure here. More than that, we know from the writing of the apostles that that present suffering produces an eternal reward. The one who overcomes is bringing us through these trials and tribulations, these conflicts, so that we too might overcome. And so our character is built up towards the likeness of Christ. This is all quite a summation, really. We could have preached three sermons at least just unpacking what the victory of Christ means in this particular context. Hopefully what has been offered here briefly is enough to at least suggest the kind of perspective shift, a paradigm shift, the realization of the victory of Christ is in our troubles. It just changes everything about it. And when it changes everything about it, and so it changes the way that we think about it, the way that we should feel about it, the way that we experience it, so that we can have peace. 
because the circumstances are no longer so threatening as they were, because the things that they can now threaten are of less importance than we might otherwise have thought. Right? Because Christ has overcome sin, we no longer have the fear of the judgment and the wrath of God. That has been forgiven. And because that has been forgiven, death is no longer something to be loathed and feared. It has lost its power and its sting, as the Apostle says. And because he has conquered, because he has conquered, we have treasures laid up in heaven. Our best life is yet to come. And so the things of this world, they are no longer the things that are most valuable to us. Our treasures are laid up where moss and rust do not destroy and where the thief cannot break in and steal. Now, all of this is simple. It's very simple what we're talking about doing here. All that we are saying is, watch your thoughts, especially in the midst of troubles. Do you find yourself encountering sickness or loss or some form of persecution and thinking, ah, oh, this is so terrible, this is too much? How can I get through this? How am I going to be saved from this, delivered from this? The threat is just so great. And then falling into hopelessness, oh, they are going to take this and this and this from me and I cannot do anything to stop them and I am going to lose and then when I lose this, I shall lose yet more. And we find ourselves thinking that. We must take hold of those thoughts and bring them to the Word of God and go, now wait a second. Is it really this way? This is how I feel. This is what I perceive. This is what I sense. But what do I know to be true? Is there really such a great threat? Oh, my soul is held in the sovereign hand of the Almighty God, and no one can snatch me from it, not even Satan and all of his cadre of demons with the power of the world behind them, and the darkness of my own soul can cause me to slip from his grasp. So too are all the promises that he made enforced by his sovereign might. So those things that he says that I shall have, I shall have them surely. And no one could take them from me. And we must continue to do this because the circumstance itself may persist and the temptation will persist. And we must day by day, moment by moment, continue to take our thoughts captive and to subject them to the truth, the Word of God, to the fact that Jesus has overcome and that that victory has assured us that we too will overcome. Perhaps not in this moment, not today, but soon, soon we shall see that we are conquerors. And as the Apostle Paul says, in this we have become even more than conquerors. In his name and to his glory. Yes, it is simple, but it's not easy. And I would not have anyone under the illusion that this is going to be easy. It is going to be hard, very hard. It's going to be hard because the world doesn't teach us to do this. In fact, it teaches us everything else. We learn our lesson well. We're not born with this innate ability to do this or this predisposition 
to take our thoughts captive and to force them to recognize the truth. Our inborn inclination is to let our feelings and perceptions run away with us, to act like we are the arbiters of truth and what we think and feel creates reality. And we must overcome that. And we must overcome it in a moment where we are hurting, where we're in pain, where our vision is darkened and narrowed. We are short-sighted. We must do it against a chorus of voices that are crying out, it's not so. That truth that you cling to is false. We have to tune them out. Beloved, it's not going to be easy. I know. If it wasn't easy for me, it's still not easy for me. I'll tell you that it gets easier. Each time that you do it, it gets a little easier. As you develop a habit, it gets a little easier. As you practice, you become a little more proficient. But it can be done. Do not give up. That's the real secret. And this and in everything that we'll talk about, the real secret is not losing hope of continuing to press on in the moments where it feels like this isn't working and I need relief now. Keep going. You're not alone. You're not trying to do this by yourself. As those who are in Christ, the Spirit is there with you interceding for you with groanings unutterable. And Christ, too, intercedes for you. As a great high priest who knew the troubles of this world when he talked about them, who was acquainted with all of our tribulations, who can relate to us no matter what we are going through today, who loves us dearly, who is working all things to our good, it may feel like he is far off and like his victory just doesn't matter because we're not a part of it. But that is not what he said. What he said is true. What we feel about it very often is not. Trust that he is there. Have faith that it is so, especially when you don't feel it. And soon enough, your faulty perceptions will begin to give way and you will perceive the truth more fully. And you will have a peace that surpasses all understanding. If you are listening to this and you do not know Christ as your Lord, if you have not Come to him in the spirit of surrender, turning away from your old sins, the way that you used to live, in rebellion against him, and bowed your knee willingly before him, and dedicated yourself to follow him. I do not see how you can have any peace in this life. You too will know troubles. And who is there to help you? Well, left to your own devices, I think. I know in the past when I strayed from the way of God, that is how I found myself. It's only my own powers against every trial and tribulation and trouble that I felt. If only you will acknowledge his victory. 
If only you will wave the white flag of surrender and come under his banner, you too can have the peace of an assured victory. And so much more besides, there is more truth to come that speaks to our hurts and our hardest moments. And I look forward to sharing it with you all. Let me pray for you as we close this session. Father, we thank you for sending your Son in our likeness to live among us, to be acquainted with our troubles and trials, to undergo tribulation that he did not deserve. We thank you for making him who knew no sin to be sin for us, for enduring the fullness of the wrath Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which we so rightly deserved. We thank you that you have won through, Lord Christ. We thank you graciously offering us a chance to be part of that victory. Live under the winning banner as part of the eternal kingdom. And it has cost us nothing. And it has given us everything. I pray that you would be with those who are in trouble today. That you would, Holy Spirit, mark these words upon their hearts indelibly. And help them to see and to understand what the victory of Christ means for us in our moments of tribulation. Be with the saints who are undergoing the tribulation spoken of most particularly in these passages. Give them strength to overcome the victory of Christ might be well known in those places where it is most thoroughly challenged. God grants this for the sake of your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for your attention to God's word today. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.